A few months back, I reviewed Samsung's S20 series lineup, and with so many premium features, we were left curious as to what exactly would be left to improve on with the Note series. The Galaxy Note series has traditionally embodied the very best Samsung has to offer, and with the new Note 20 Ultra, this certainly seems to be the case. But with the regular Note 20, Samsung have taken numerous shortcuts in order to keep the cost down, to the point where these two phones are very different, and it's clearly not just a case of having two of the same smartphone in different sizes. The Note 20, with all of its shortcomings, still costs $1000 a flagship smartphone compromising in all areas except for price, which makes you wonder how exactly this fits into the current market with so many better value options available. In this review, we'll be covering all of the new features in depth, explaining all of the differences between the two phones, and finding out which of these offers better value for your money. Let's take a look. Taking a look first at the design, it's not so much the size difference, but the shape of the phones you'll notice first. The Note 20 Ultra is extremely boxy, a design I know a lot of you love, but I personally prefer the Note 20's more rounded style, which I find looks better and feels more comfortable in the hand. The Ultra is only marginally larger than last year's Note 10 Plus, but the regular Note 20 is significantly larger than the Note 10, so there's not really a small option this year. A lot of people will be pleased to see the power and volume buttons return to the right-hand side of the phones, a change that many people weren't happy about with last year's Note 10s. For me, this feels more natural, and the buttons are placed in an easy-to-reach position. The S Pen has now been moved over to the left side, so I actually think this layout will suit left-handed users better, and those of you who are right-handed and use a little finger to prop up the phone may find yourselves covering up the speaker as you hold it. But I don't think any of these changes are really going to be a problem, it's just something to get used to. Just like last year's phones, only the higher spec model gets the hybrid SIM card tray, which means that only the Note 20 Ultra has expandable storage. Depending on your region, there will be restrictions on the base storage of these phones too, with US customers stuck with just 128GB for the regular Note 20, half the storage of last year's Note 10 options, whilst the Ultra has a 512GB option, but only in Mystic Black. You'll also notice the new colour options, which are much more muted and understated than the colourful Aura Glow model from last year, but what I really like are the new satin finishes. This is available for all three colours of the Note 20, I think this Mystic Green is one of the best looking phones we've seen this year, albeit a little familiar. But unfortunately, only the Mystic Bronze Note 20 Ultra has the satin finish, a colour I'm personally not a big fan of. So although I think the white Ultra is the best looking, the glossy finish doesn't look or feel nearly as nice as the satin Note 20 finish. Google did a similar thing with the Pixel 4s last year, and I really wish this satin finish, and especially all storage options, were available across the board. But the biggest talking point by far is the material choices, because Samsung's $1000 flagship Note 20 is made of plastic. This was perhaps the single biggest surprise from Samsung's announcement, and understandably, a lot of people are quite angry about this. Even the front display has been downgraded to Gorilla Glass 5, but swapping the rear glass panel for a cheaper plastic is a harder pill to swallow. I have to admit though that because of the satin texture, the phone does still feel really nice in the hand, and of course the plastic is lighter and less likely to shatter. But I think a phone this expensive deserves to be made from more premium materials, so let me know in the comments if this would be a deal breaker for you. The Ultra, on the other hand, is made from the new Gorilla Glass Victus, the toughest Gorilla Glass yet. The metal frame is even finally upgraded to stainless steel, although Samsung tells me that the Note 20 has this too, but the Ultra has a much more premium build quality all round. The new Note 20s are most easily distinguished by their new camera modules, and now that we've gotten used to these big rectangular designs, I actually think these look pretty nice. However, the Ultra's camera bump is very thick, in fact, almost comically so. There are practical implications of such a thick camera bump that go beyond the aesthetics. For example, getting this caught on your jeans pocket, collecting dust, and in some instances, stopping the phone from laying flat against a wireless charger. This is all rectified by using a phone case, of course, as I'm sure most of you will be. 
but I still don't think the purchase of an additional accessory is ever a great justification for design flaws. And I'd personally take a thicker phone, packing a bigger battery and a nice flush camera lens any day of the week. The other point about using a phone case is that this can also offset any potential issues with the Note 20's build materials. And I think it's fair to ask if it even matters that your phone is made of plastic if you're sticking it inside a phone case anyway. So that's perhaps a minor defence for the Note 20. Just like last year's models, the Note 20 Ultra has a curved display, so accidental screen touches are still possible. The Note 20's display, however, is completely flat, but as a consequence is not able to achieve the super thin bezels of the Ultra. Personally, I always prefer a flat display, and I think the practical benefits outweigh the slight aesthetic differences, since both phones offer a near all screen design. The hole punch returns from last year too, but you'll notice that this is smaller and more discreet on the Ultra, despite the fact that these cameras have the same specs. We have the same biometrics too, including Samsung's face unlock and the ultrasonic fingerprint scanner. They're positioned well and are as fast and reliable as any fingerprint scanner is. You still run into issues of this failing to register, which can get annoying, and it's not as reliable or convenient as a secure face unlock method like on an iPhone or a Pixel 4. Those of you familiar with my videos will know how much I love those systems. But then again, in this pandemic era that we find ourselves living in, for a lot of people, the fingerprint scanner is the best biometric system we have, because face unlock systems just don't work when you're wearing a mask. In terms of specs, the display is another area where the Ultra is superior to the regular Note 20. The Ultra has a 6.9 inch 1440p display with a 120Hz refresh rate, whilst the Note 20 has just a 1080p 60Hz panel with a lower pixel density. Only the Ultra gets the super high contrast ratio and new 1500 nits of maximum brightness, which makes for much better HDR content and improved viewing in bright conditions. Samsung refused to provide the exact specs for the Note 20, but suffice to say that the Ultra is noticeably brighter in day-to-day -day use, and especially when viewing content outdoors. Don't get me wrong, the Note 20's display is still bright and colourful, and these are both great devices for consuming media content. It's just that a phone of this price, carrying Samsung's high-end Note moniker, feels underwhelming with the display specs that it has, with some even lower than last year's models. The Ultra on the other hand, is specced out with pretty much the best you can get, and this is clearly one of, if not the, best looking displays out there. It's not just the impressive colour or sharpness that warrants the credit, it's really the high refresh rate that makes this display so great to use, and what gives you that much better an experience compared to using the regular Note 20. There's probably not a good reason for a Note 10 user to upgrade their phone, but if there was, the high refresh rate would be it. The only downside is that this does take a toll on the battery life, even though the refresh rate is adaptive, and you can't have Quad HD Plus resolution and 120Hz at the same time. I know some people expected this would come later with software updates, but I've got the S20 Ultra here, and this still doesn't support that either. So if you're using the high refresh rate, it looks like you're going to be locked to 1080p again. Moving on now to the cameras, the Note 20 has essentially the same camera setup as the S20, with matching specs and a very similar performance. But with the Note 20 Ultra, Samsung are clearly learning from mistakes made with the S20 Ultra pairing the 108 megapixel main lens with a new laser autofocus sensor, and ditching overhyped and disappointing gimmicks like 100x space zoom. There's an all new telephoto lens that uses periscoping technology to achieve a 5x optical zoom, and a more sensible 50x maximum zoom. The camera performance from both of these phones is fantastic, pretty similar to that of the S20 and S20+, Plus, but I noticed some general improvements to image quality, such as dynamic range, compared with the previous Note series. In typical Samsung fashion, the cameras still try to over-sharpen and crank up the contrast, which some will argue keep these phones behind the likes of the iPhone or the Pixel. Colour accuracy is often still an issue, especially on the Note 20, and the magenta hue you can see in the sky here isn't as true to life as what you can see with the iPhone. But Samsung's aggressive image processing often works in its favour too, and the vibrancy and brightness make photos really pop on screen, and clearly these triple lens camera setups make the notes much more versatile compared to the Pixel 4. The ultra wide megapixel count actually drops from the Note 10 16 down to 12, but we've seen before that the megapixel count isn't everything, and actually the sensor improvements should provide benefits to capturing light and colour. 
For the majority of the time, the two phones had very similar performance, and in a blind test, I think you'd struggle to tell them apart, which is remarkable given how different the main sensors actually are. What I noticed using these phones side by side were some of the familiar drawbacks of having a large main sensor, and the Ultra suffered from slower autofocus and a slower capture time compared to the regular Note 20. The biggest problem I found is with close-up subjects, and this is an area where you will be able to tell the cameras apart, since the Ultra's huge main sensor captures a very shallow plane of focus, and you can see how much more of this plant is in focus on the regular Note 20. However, Samsung have managed to fix the awful focus hunting issues that plagued the S20 Ultra. This was a huge problem that the S20 Ultra still suffers from today, and it seems as though trading the time of flight camera that let's face it no one was using for this new laser autofocus sensor has made a massive improvement. Focusing isn't as fast as on the regular Note 20, but the hunting issues are gone, so you just need to be a bit more patient. The low light performance has been significantly improved too, not just from the Note 10s, but even from the S20 series. In fact, the low light performance is so good that I really only needed to switch to night mode in extreme dark conditions, where the phones do a great job of exposing the scene. I often found the main photo mode took better looking images than night mode, since you can capture the true darkness of the real life scene. The main difference I noticed between the two phones was that the Ultra suffered less with noise, especially using the main photo mode as opposed to night mode. But what surprised me most was how much Samsung have dialed back the overprocessing that Galaxy phones typically suffer from, sometimes capturing images that were more realistic than both the Pixel 4 and the iPhone 11 Pro. The two phones generally considered to have the best nighttime performance, but in these photos here, falling short of the Galaxies. The notes aren't perfect, and do have a tendency to overbrighten shadows, just like last year's Note 10s, but the improvements to the low light performance overall are very impressive. Now in the previous images, the Ultra was using pixel binning to produce the 12 megapixel photos that the regular Note 20 takes, so to take advantage of the full 108 megapixels of the main sensor, you actually have to enable this in a separate mode. Just as we saw with the S20 Ultra, this mode seems to crush the black levels, giving photos an unnatural contrast. Plus you have to really crop in quite far and start pixel peeping before you'll notice that higher resolution, so I still don't find this mode worth the slow capture time and large file sizes. The regular Note 20 has a kind of higher res mode too, using the 64 megapixel telelens just like the S20. As we found with the S20s though, there's not a substantial difference from the regular mode, or indeed compared to the Ultra, so again, I wouldn't say this is a huge benefit over the regular Note. Where the Ultra really pulls ahead though is with zoom photography, and switching to the telephoto lenses, these phones will default to their maximum optical ranges of 3x hybrid optic in the Note 20 and 5x optical in the Ultra. Even at these lower zoom levels, the Ultra performs better, but the benefits of that periscoping lens really become clear at 10x and higher. Both phones are using digital zooming alongside their optical capabilities, but you can see how much more detail the Ultra is able to maintain. The Note 20 maxes out at 30x, whilst the Ultra can go up to 50x, and though both phones struggle at their maximum zoom levels, I think the main takeaway from this is how much better the Ultra performs with zoom photography. I personally rarely use a camera's zoom, and the Note 20's 30x zoom is plenty for me, so with the phone's faster capture time and better close-up performance, I think the Note 20 actually has the more practical camera of the two. The video quality has been bumped up to match the specs of the S20 series, and I've taken these walking videos so that you can see how good the stability is, even without super steady mode turned on. Video is still behind the iPhone as we expected, but it's better than on any Samsung device before, and I think as good as any Android device on the market today. The phones struggle more in low light conditions, and introduce a lot of noise to the image as we've seen in previous models too. I noticed that the Ultra performs a lot better here though, so there does seem to be a general improvement to the low light performance with the Ultra compared to the regular model. Just like the S20 series, these phones can both record in 8K at 24 frames per second. It's better on the Note 20 Ultra than the S20 Ultra, thanks to the new laser autofocus, but that doesn't change the fact that the 8K footage is still pretty choppy, takes up a ton of storage on your device, and do you actually own an 8K display to watch it back on anyway? Probably not. More useful new features come to the Pro Video mode, including zoom controls, and the option to select the microphone source, including from the device itself, 
via USB-C, or even from a connected Bluetooth device. So at the very least, these are clearly two of the most versatile video recording phones on the market. As for the front cameras, these are both identical, and in fact have exactly the same specs as last year's Note 10s and this year's S20, delivering pretty much the same performance as before too. The phones are still desperate to smooth skin tones, and still make you jump through hoops to disable all of those beauty features. But in general, the selfie camera is pretty good, producing sharp and bright images. The live focus mode gives a nice blurred background, and does a decent job of separating the subject from it. But just as we saw last year, the cameras sometimes struggle with the cutout around hair and other tricky features. The rear cameras do a much better job with the live focus effect, and often produced a near-perfect cutout. So although neither of these phones came equipped with the depth vision camera of last year's Note 10 Plus, I don't think this is a feature that will be missed. When cropping in, I noticed that the Note 20's images were actually sharper than the Ultra's, which is likely due to the fact that it takes the live focus images on its higher resolution telephoto lens, whereas the Ultra uses the larger main sensor and therefore produces a softer image. But again, there's not a big difference unless you're really looking for it. The front-facing video has been improved too, and both phones now come with 4K60 recording right out of the box, which only became available to last year's models via a software update. But just as we saw with the rear cameras, it's the stability that really seems to have been improved. So in general, the video quality of this year's Note models is the best we've seen from Samsung so far. But moving on from the cameras, no flagship smartphones would be complete without the latest performance specs, and the phones are packing the new Snapdragon 865 Plus and Exynos 990 processors. This means that the US Snapdragon models are even upgraded compared to the S20 series, but the international Exynos models aren't, and I'm going to come back to this problem later on. The Note 20 has 8GB of RAM compared to the Ultra's 12, so again, the regular Note doesn't get the same top tier specs, and as we saw earlier, the base storage is halved compared to last year's phones. Both models of course come with 5G, which may be important for the few of you who have access to it, and there's even a 4G version of the Note 20 available in some regions like the UK. Both phones feel very fast and snappy to use, but it's mainly the fluidity of the Ultra's 120Hz panel that makes it feel like a faster phone, not only compared to last year's models, but even to its Note 20 sibling. With their huge displays, these phones are designed for productivity, and give you a huge screen real estate to work on, so it's good to see them packing the power for even the most demanding tasks like multitasking, editing, and gaming. This is of course made easier with the S Pen, which this year comes with a bunch of new improvements and software features, including new air gestures, better handwriting recognition, but especially a reduction in latency. Thanks to the Ultra's high refresh rate display, this is brought down from 45 milliseconds to just 9, on par with the market-leading stylus performance. The regular Note 20's S Pen latency only drops to 26 milliseconds, and whilst this is still an improvement over the previous Note series, it doesn't feel quite as smooth as on the Ultra. Samsung Notes has a bunch of new features for annotations, importing PDFs, and syncing with other platforms like Microsoft's PowerPoint, and it's now genuinely one of the best Notes apps out there. So for those of you who use the stylus often, this year's Note 20s have some of the best S Pen improvements we've seen for years, and this really helps to highlight the benefit of getting a Note over another smartphone like an S20. An important aspect of a phone's performance is the battery life, and Samsung have bumped up the phone's batteries to 4300 and 4500 mAh respectively. Pushing these phones to the max, you'll still make it through a full day, and I was averaging at least 6 hours of screen on time. But as I mentioned earlier, the Ultra's high refresh rate really takes a toll, and the regular Note 20 was giving me much better battery performance. Simply draining the battery with a continuous video loop, which doesn't really tax the high refresh rate, left me with over 20% battery remaining on the Note 20 when the Ultra's battery died. Thankfully, if you do need to top up the phone, you can do this in just over an hour with the included 25 watt fast chargers. Neither phone supports the 45 watt charging from the Note 10 Plus but there's honestly not a significant difference in the charging time compared to the 25 watt chargers. Plus you needed to buy this charger separately for the Note 10 Plus, so this isn't really a downgrade in my view. Fast wireless charging and reverse wireless charging returned from last year too, so the phones are pretty versatile when it comes to charging. But I want to come back to this issue of the different processors inside these phones because there is a significant gap in performance between the US Snapdragon versions and the international Exynos models, 
and there really shouldn't be. Real-world testing has consistently shown a significant performance boost for the Snapdragon models, in some cases as much as 20%, and we now know from videos like Zack's Teardown that the phones even have different internal components, like the cooling systems. The Exynos models are much more likely to overheat and thermal throttle, and I can certainly testify from my use that both the Note 20 and Ultra get very warm, even under light loads. The Snapdragon performance boost has even been shown to produce better photos and provide a longer battery compared to the Exynos models, and remember, these are supposed to be the exact same phone. The reason this is so unfair is because many people will receive a phone with poorer specs and performance just because of where they live in the world, and Samsung should be much more transparent about this. Let's not forget that Samsung is pretending that the US and international models are the same phone. They're marketing them the same, and aside from currency differences, they're charging the same prices. But as far as I'm concerned, two phones that have different internal components that perform differently are not the same phone. You do get more storage in the international models than the US models, but for me, this doesn't offset the loss in performance. Plus this further difference is just adding to the whole issue of Samsung not selling the same phones. This topic could really be discussed in a whole separate video, but the sad reality is, you're getting a much better deal if you happen to live in the US, and you'd have every right to be annoyed about this unfair treatment as a customer. I wouldn't blame anyone who decided to skip buying a Samsung phone until this imbalance is addressed. So, should you buy one of these two phones? Well for me, I think there's only one you should even consider. It's not so much that the Note 20 isn't an improvement from the Note 10, it's just that the upgrade wouldn't be worthwhile. There are really only minor tweaks, and even some downgrades when compared to the Note 10 Plus, and it just generally misses out on the exciting new features that the Ultra has. Just to recap, the Note 20 has a lower res screen that doesn't get the high refresh rate, there's no telescoping zoom lens, there's less RAM, no expandable storage, and it's a phone made of plastic. Sitting next to its superior Ultra brother, you can't help but notice all of these drawbacks. And maybe that was Samsung's point, maybe the Ultra is the phone they really want to sell. But it means that the Note 20 is a phone I just can't recommend whilst it sits at its $1000 starting price. If it's cost saving that you're going for, then I'd recommend something offering better value for your money, like one of the S20s, or if you need the S Pen, then one of last year's Note 10s. As for the Ultra, this really is a fantastic phone all round that I could recommend, even if you end up with one of the Exynos models, but with the major caveat that you need to be someone who would make full use of the S Pen and otherwise you should save yourself $300 and pick up the very similar S20 Plus instead. Again, there's no need to upgrade from a Note 10 or 10 Plus, but hardcore Note enthusiasts may get a kick out of the Ultra's high refresh rate display and ultra low latency S Pen. But let me know which one of these phones you're thinking about buying. Does the vast difference between the US and international models put you off buying a Samsung phone this year? And if so, which other phones are you thinking about buying? Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.